Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Learn with Jason. Today on the show, we have Brent Vatney. Brent, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so uh, you and I have met. Uh, I, I emceed Chain React, or I co emceed Chain React. Uh, was it last year? Yeah. Oh my God. That feels, that like, feels a like a decade ago. ago. <laughs> wow. Um, and, and so we met there, uh, had a great time. It was out in Portland. So I got to, you know, I got to play host a little bit in the, in the home city. Yeah. Um, and since then I've been just kind of passingly familiar with your work because we sort of work on different ends of the spectrum or so I thought, uh, until we started talking about this episode. So for those of us who aren't familiar with your work, do you want to give us a little bit of a background? Sure. So React Native has been out for something like five years now. Um, when it was first released, I thought it was just a really awesome project. So I jumped in and started contributing right away um, and kind of got into, I was in consulting at the time. And so got into some consulting projects around that and, uh, and got into uh, eventually working on this project called Expo. It was called Exponent at the time when I started working on it. Um, and so what Exponent is, or Expo, is this... Uh, Basically, like a, I'd like to explain it as like Rails for React Native. Um, so we do a lot of the uh, work that you might otherwise have to do manually. Um, mm. Kind of just put you on some convenient guide rails to help you speed up uh, getting your app shipped, building uh, the first version of your app, as well as continuing to iterate on it and grow it and and so on. Um, and so it's this set of not only libraries and SDK, but also <laughs> nice. Thank you for the sub, Spencer. <laughs> uh, a suite of, of services uh, that's built around it. So um, you know, a, a lot of the time when people uh, want to automate um, kind of building and deploying to a store, uh, they'll maybe use something like Microsoft App Center, um, or maybe do their builds even on like. Mm -hmm. uh, GitHub Actions um, and maybe deploy through, yeah, some some tool using like Fastlane, um, and so we kind of just take care of all of that sort of thing for you through the build service. So you run this command, we manage your credentials for you. That's a, you know this hairy topic that a lot of people uh, I think kind of holds people back from um, getting involved in in native builds. It's just these mm -hmm. variety of, of blockers along the way, and one of those is credentials management and. You have to learn about key stores and provisioning profiles and development certificates and you know sharing these across machines with different users on your development team and so on. So we kind of just like handle all of that for you. You run a command, uh, we manage the credentials, we mm -hmm. help you create them and, and so on, and then do the build and help you ship that to the app store. Uh, and then we also manage over the air updates, which is kind of like um, like what you get on the web for by default for free, which is wild that you can't just do this on every platform <laughs> out of the box. Right? <laughs> uh, so what I mean by that is like you once you've deployed your app, and if you want to make a small change, you want to change some text in the app or uh, add a small bit of content or fix a bug or something. Uh, yeah. Typically, you have to resubmit the app to the store. You have to do another build of your app, get this. You know, 50 megabyte binary or whatever, upload it to Apple, wait for Apple to approve it, which is actually pretty fast these days. But um, still, it's you know, it's a, probably a day long uh, wait to to get there. Um, and so, over the air updates are like, you can just push these small changes mm. uh, through changes to the JavaScript bundle to your app, so your users can get it right away rather than having to go through this oh, process yeah. and, and delay rolling it out. Interesting. Uh, I didn't so realize you could even do that. Yeah, uh, nice. React Native uh, makes it possible, um, but other similar sort of hybrid tools uh, do this as well, like Cordova uh, can do it there. Um, I think most native apps have some kind of mechanism to support over the air updates, whether it's like a, a proprietary templating view language uh, where, where maybe you send over the contents of a screen as JSON and then uh, render it with your native views. Uh, there, there's a lot of different techniques, um, mm -hmm. but the the one provided by Expo is basically you just send the JavaScript bundle for your app and the assets, download that, and then load it the next time you load your app. So nice. like a website. Yeah, yeah that's that's super cool. Um, so uh, like, 
This might be a little bit of a loaded topic, but I, I have I have a few questions, and I think that these will these will potentially be shared by the chat. Remember, chat, if you have questions, you can drop them as well. Um, but I'm always kind of curious, like what what do you think the benefit is of um, like why why would I build a native app? You know, especially as the the um, the capabilities of the web are are expanding. Um, what's my like what's my my reason or like what what do you think is a is a good driver? Or maybe actually a better question. What's the heuristic? Like at what point would you say, yeah, you should totally build a native app now? Well, I'll answer that fully in a moment. But one, one thing that I, I think we want to do with Expo is maybe eliminate that question. Okay. And you can instead just build a native app and a website at the same time. And so okay. you don't have to think about building all of these uh, completely separate code bases from scratch. Um, but as for why you might actually want to have a native app and why you might explore the solution, I think it really depends on the, uh, the, the product that you're building. Um, something like, let's say Netflix, for example, um, the experience that you get from using the app, um, the ability to um, do things like push notifications, which still aren't supported for PWAs on iOS, and, and realistically, iOS is good, or Apple, rather, is going to continue to uh, yeah. hinder this, I think, for <laughs> in the foreseeable future, unfortunately. Um, something like push notifications or or maybe their own custom uh, video player with with uh, sort of capabilities that maybe you would not be able to uh, ship with the web. Um, I think the, the some of this changes a little bit as the, the web gets more mature, but sure. ultimately, um, I think native platforms will continue to be for certain use cases, several years at least ahead of the web, as the web has to adapt to um, new technologies and new APIs and sort of adapt them, uh, include them into the standards, ship that in a new version of the browser, and so on. Um, yeah. So there'll always be like this this game of, of chase, basically. So I think th that's one category of app. Um, this is just like things that require some like novel or cutting edge API or really performance uh, oriented uh, sure. code. OK, um, cool. And I, th I think also there's just general sort of um, your typical information app. Um, I would say you should probably should have a website in these contexts most of the time. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think that at least in, in my case, I typically enjoy the experience of using an app on my phone a lot better than a website. And as much as uh, I love the web, and you know, we're building Expo in a way that we're like trying to recreate the, the developer experience of using the web on iOS and Android and kind of make it work everywhere. Um, but at the same time, um, there, there are just limitations to mm. what you can accomplish in a web browser on mobile currently. And um, simple things like having really nice gestures in your app um, are, are just not really feasible on the web currently. Um, and using some of these built-in platform tools as well that can help you uh, get your app into kind of a, a better state without having to rebuild on top of um, you know, UI libraries that maybe like something like Bootstrap, which I guess is kind of out of fashion these days. But, um, if instead you just use the design language of the platform you're working on, and yeah, read it, some of those primitives. So that's something that that I feel like has come up a few times, especially in in kind of design circles, right? Is like when you look at native apps, the the level of polish that you see in a, a typical native app seems to be just kind of far and away above what the the default would be for like a web experience. And it, so you're saying that that's coming out of the that's coming out of the native apps kind of laying a bunch of groundwork for you. I think that that is a, a big factor for sure. Um, and then there's also a, a matter of the ceiling. I think that maybe the end result ends up being somewhere of like the average between the floor and the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And on the web, the floor is you know plain HTML page with blue anchor tags and black text and a white background. And um, on on native, the floor is like using these kind of built-in components that you get, like UI navigation controller 
um, which just provide like a pretty nice experience out of the sure. box for you. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Then, that that totally makes yeah. sense. Um, and so even the ceiling of of the web, um, you would you wouldn't be able to recreate some of the things that are available on on native. Um, yeah, and and I've definitely found myself in a lot of like Stack Overflow threads. Like, how do I recreate this feature of of like the iOS experience? Or like, how you know? I remember when pull to refresh was like a like a game changer, right? And everybody was trying to figure out how to recreate that on on the web. Um, and so I, I can definitely see what you're saying about native is just going to be a little bit further ahead because you've got more fine grained control. You're not waiting on standard support. You're not waiting on multiple browser vendors to implement a feature. Um, okay, so that, that totally makes sense. Um, so uh, another question that came in is, uh, I think we can talk a little bit about like performance specifics later on, but um, so when Expo, you mentioned that Expo allows us to use the same code base. Thank you for the sub, Nathan Um What, uh, yeah. oh wait, Nate Norberg, that's what it is, isn't it? I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm really bad at Twitch names. I always like, I'm like reading them very phonetically. Uh, Honestly, so, I was impressed. I, I thought you read that and, and just knew what that name was. And was like, I would not have said it like that. Impressive, Jason. That's just me making stuff up. Uh, no. Uh, so, so, yeah, I think like what's really interesting about Expo is that you're, you're presenting a, a sort of have your cake and eat it to opportunity here where like we want to be on the web. But we also want to we want to have native apps because of all the reasons that you mentioned, um, and you're saying that we can use the same code base to make that happen. So what right. what is the code base that we use? Like, is that uh, are we doing that with React Native? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So React Native um, React Native itself is kind of an increasingly uh, small core library that includes kind of these core set of primitives, which sometimes I think is an overused word, but I think applies nicely here, um, where the primitives are things like view and text and image, um, something like a scroll view, so like a scrollable view, um, a style sheet, right? some way to do styling, some um, layout system, uh, and then a plugin system for how you can extend that and add your own components on top of that. Um, and then there's also, of course, this runtime that will allow this code to execute on uh, the platform that you're running on and uh, render down to native views on those platforms. So the view uh, would translate to like a div on the web and would be a UI view on iOS, or maybe in the future, uh, like a Swift view component. OK, very cool. Um, yeah, well, and so, sorry, so just to, to extend from that, um, so, so that's kind of the core of, of React Native. And then what Expo kind of provides on top of that, um, going back to like the Rails comparison, um, you know, that, that's kind of like what you get with maybe using Ruby on its own with like uh, a simple web server or something like that. You have mm -hmm. all of the things that you really need to build an app, but then you might end up rolling a lot on your own after that. So we're kind of trying to uh, provide that more cohesive experience on top of. Gotcha. That. OK, very cool. Yeah. So I think like I, I am I'm really excited to see how this works in action. So if you're OK with it, let's just switch over and start building something. What do you think? Yeah, it sounds great. All right, let's do it. So I'm going to move over to this view. And OK, before we get started, let's do a quick shout out to our sponsors. We've got uh, Live captioning on the show today, you can go to lwj.dev slash live to see that. And the live captions are here. Uh, these are provided by White Coat Captioning. Thank you so, so much to White Coat for being here today. Um, and live captioning is made possible by our sponsors. We've got Netlify, Fauna, Sanity, and Auth0 all chipping in to make this show more accessible to more people, which we very much appreciate. Uh, also, make sure that you go and uh, follow Brent on Twitter to learn all the things about Expo and all the things that you're working on. Um, okay, so this is Expo, right? Here's here's Expo here, and we are going to be um, we're going to put this theory to the test. The fastest way to build an app. Uh, so if I want to get started, um, yeah. what should I do? Uh, you can scroll up to the top. 
here okay. or underneath that, wherever you want. Uh, and there's a get started button. Okay. And this will guide you through uh, the high level steps. So you need node, you need Expo CLI. Okay. And uh, you need I think I have Expo CLI. Let me check. Yes. Is um, That's good. Do I need to like check? Oops. Is it dash dash version? Yeah. It is. is that the right version? That'll do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, okay. And so now uh, I can. Subscribers are rolling in today. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Oh, uh, oh, oh, look at this. Michael <laughs> Jolly out here gifting everybody subscriptions. Thank you very, very much. And I think we came up with a name for this. What was it? Are we the Boop Crew now? We're the Boop Crew. Welcome to the Boop Crew. Uh, <laughs> make sure you spam those boops. Remember, you can, uh, if you work together as a team, bury us. So uh, yeah, feel free to <laughs> feel free to make that happen. Um, and while you do that, I am going to initialize this project. So let's uh, expo init, and I guess I'll move it up so that when they bury us, we can still read. And I just choose any folder name. Yeah, or you can just hit enter, and it'll prompt you for a name. Oh, cool. Okay, expo init. All right. So let's just choose the blank template here. Blank. Yeah. And we'll name this. Um, what are we doing today? Uh, we're going to take the Corgi app uh, that you built in the Firebase episode, and we're going to make it run in React Native. Oh, very cool. OK, so we'll call this. Um, what did we call that app? This app was called Corgi Photos. So we'll call this Corgi Photos uh, Expo. Sounds good. Um, okay. Right. So this will basically just clone uh, a template project, um, extract it, and then it's running yarn for us, which, uh, you know, it is what it is. It takes some time. <laughs> we, we know the ecosystem that we're in. Indeed. Uh -huh. we, right. we know what we did. <laughs> <laughs> None of us is innocent in this game. <laughs> um, okay, so now we've got our, our app up here uh, is built. So I'm going to move into Corgi Expo or Kogi, well, Corgi Photos Expo. And then yep. let's take a look at this. Teach dot. Nice. Okay. Uh, it, it does kind of sound like a, a convention where people share their Corgi photos. Kind of into that. I like the idea of, a, of an expo hall full of corgi photos. <laughs> That's true. OK, so let's see. Um, this looks pretty clean. So we've got uh, an assets folder, which has what looks like some pretty basic stuff, um, yep. an app JSON. And I assume this is all meta. Uh, yeah, this is the stuff that's used to configure your project. So things that aren't code. Our app icon. Set the icon, the Got orientation it. lock or not lock of the app. Um, nice. And okay. things like that. Yeah. So this is just some basic stuff that you might want in every app there. Uh, cool. And then app.js is where the real stuff is, is happening. OK. Um, Excellent. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. Just to, to run through this real quick, because a few things are different when you're looking at React Native, right? So a couple things that I would expect to see in here would be like divs, but we can't use divs in React Native. Is that right? You could if you had a, uh, a component that was only going to run on the web, which you can do by specifying the .web.js extension. OK. But ideally, you would stick to using the view component, which wraps divs and does it in a way that is uh, just and, guess, and so from a normalizes the styles and other things that you kind of want to just keep um, yeah. nice and so, so if I'm thinking about this as a, a like as a web developer coming into this if I'm going to write in react native the view is my div like that's my my generic wrapper component that I would use is that is that correct yeah exactly okay um, and then we use text instead of paragraphs. And then the status bar, this is an Expo-specific thing, right? 
Yeah, so there's one that uh, is included in the React Native core itself. Um, this one from the Expo package uh, is a slightly different API, and uh, it's just meant to also handle different themes a little bit better. So if you have a dark theme or light theme enabled, it'll just do the right thing out of the box. And um, like I was saying, the React Native package is um, basically becoming smaller and including just kind of the fundamental primitives that okay. are needed for these apps. And I imagine status bar will be something that'll be removed at some point as well. Okay, um, cool. Yeah. Um, and then we've got some basic, basic styles. Uh, and then you said, we're going to take this app here, which is um, a list of corgis, and we are going to make those, uh, we're going to make that into a native app. So if you want to learn how we did the Firebase part of this, you can go and watch this episode or check out the, the source of that, uh, of this demo here. Um, and then it, uh, you sent me some code beforehand. So this, this you, you said this is to just kind of generalize some of the code that we did in the, the Firebase app? Yeah, I basically just didn't want to um, complicate any of our app code with Firebase related code so that okay. when people are following along, they can just kind of treat the data as coming from somewhere and um, just see it as like the usage of a hook. Uh, Got it. Than, um, it. Interacting with Firebase. And so the basics of what we're doing is we're we're setting up our Firebase app. Um, these are the like the public keys that you use to connect and make sure that it's pulling from the right place. Um, we set up authentication and our database and grab the Corgis collection, which is uh, what's got these these little buddies on it. <laughs> um, a function to sign in, a function to sign out, a function to create a new Corgi, uh, a function to get the user, and a function to get all of the Corgis. Is there anything? Oh, and then here you said this one. We might not have time to get to that, but uh, but we'll yeah. so we'll we'll talk about this if we get there. Um, exactly. So do you want me to just copy paste this into the into the app? Yeah, let's just drop this into a db.js file in the in the root of the app. Why not? Okay, so let's go db.js, and now we have, in theory, <laughs> our whole everything. It's all it's all set up. Yeah, that's okay. all set up, and uh, we can do something with that shortly. Um, so, there's a. Yeah, I guess actually, what, there's a quick question start. about um, the styling. Is there an alternative for styling that is more like plain CSS? Um, the response there is, uh, I believe, correct. That you can set up emotion. Okay. Um, you can use something like. Uh, styled components, I think, which gives you a more, um, I mean, I, I guess the thing that makes it not look like CSS here, if I'm understanding correctly, is that it's camel cased uh, rather than kebab cased. It, and... Yeah, I mean, I guess like in Emotion would give you the CSS template tag where you could right. just wrap actual CSS yeah. declarations in a, a template literal, um, yeah. sort of like this. Oops, not like right. that. <laughs> Come on, stop helping. <laughs> You're too helpful. Like, you know, that that sort of thing would work yeah. in in right. uh in this if you used emotion. So that that would be the way to do that, I think. Um and if it Yeah. Yeah. That should be doable. I, I personally don't do that and I can't really comment on what the best way to do that is, but there you go. If you have a link to emotion native docs, um that's Perfect. probably a fine solution for that. Let me grab, I'll grab a link to that so it ends up in the show notes. Um, we're going to put that over here. Emotion native. This will give you the ability to do, yeah, there you go. Plain CSS. Perfect. All right. So, Plain uh, old inline CSS and JS. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So we have, uh, we've got the database at the ready. And I believe right now this, this is uh, like an expo kind of placeholder page, right? Um, exactly. So what should I do next? Well, let's run the app. Let's open it in the simulator and okay. just see what we have. And so, switch back. Yep. Uh, you should told me to, to do, should I do yarn? Do you want me to open it in the web or what do you, which one? Uh, let's run yarn start. 
And that will just open up an interactive prompt, kind of like when you run Jest. Looks like we released the new Oops. version of Xbox so you're getting a warning. Opened but... in the wrong window, so let's open it over here. Okay, so here is, this is, this is kind so of this, cool. Yeah, so this is an optional uh, web UI. Um, we used to have two separate tools where there was one that was like a uh, tool like this that shipped as an Electron app, and then we had a desktop uh, sort of terminal tool like, like this one. Um, but we wanted to consolidate those. And so by default, when you run Yarn Start, if you haven't run it before uh, or haven't disabled this, then it'll open up the uh, browser for you. Um, you can press Shift and D, and that will stop it from automatically starting in the future. Uh, and just run everything from uh, the terminal instead. So nice. okay. if you type a question mark now, you can see uh, <coughs> available commands. Ooh, um, give me just a second here. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Rubber testing. <coughs> oh, geez. All right, try as I might, I still can't breathe coffee. Um, OK, so, <laughs> so I, have, uh, I have my list of commands. Let's see. Yep. So we can press A to do Android. Uh, C. And right beside that, I for iOS or W for web. Um, oh, oh, I missed so, that part. OK. Yeah, so why don't we try opening in web first, just because I think there are a lot of web people here. So just to uh, show that. So it actually starts Webpack to. Uh, oh. OK. Yes, here we go. In this terminal. Look at it okay, happen. Fancy. Have some text. Um, so now we could go back to the terminal and press I, and that will pop open the simulator, which here. might be in another screen for you. Or, here it is. Uh, there we go. Perfect. Uh, it's defaulting, I guess, to iPhone SE on your machine. You could change that, but that doesn't really matter. That's probably best for the case of streaming right now. <laughs> so we don't uh, make the fans. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've firmly strapped down this computer so it doesn't fly away while I try <laughs> okay. to stream okay. and run an IOS simulator <laughs> and all. <laughs> uh, right. So that just opened up the uh, Expo Client app in the simulator. Um, and so I think it's worth taking this moment to explain just what the Expo Client app is. Yes, please. Um, you can kind of think of the Expo Client app as like a web browser for React Native apps. So it, it includes the entirety of the native runtime, which you could think of as like what the web platform provides in a web browser, uh, all the sets of APIs that you can interact with to build your website. Uh, it provides that for you, but the equivalent for React Native, and a mechanism for loading apps over, uh, over HTTP. So it just loaded it for us here. This is just basically like a. Uh, we downloaded the JavaScript bundle, uh, ran it, and, and here it is showing the, the result of that. Um, so, so does that mean that these are both running at the same time? Like Yes. Ooh, interesting. So yeah. then does that mean, just kind of like playing this out a little bit, <laughs> if I sure. start to make edits, Oop. Look at it go. OK, so we just edited a native app and a web app all in one code base, and it's live updating. That's slick. That's really slick. Yeah, it's, it's pretty nice. Um, one thing that, that isn't perfect yet is that on the web, we're just doing live reload rather mm -hmm. than fast refresh. Um, sure, sure, sure. And for people who aren't familiar, fast refresh is, is like the newest renamed version of hot reloading that actually works. <laughs> and so uh, on, on iOS and Android, it uses fast refresh, and it's beautiful. It just reloads the, the code that you change, works great. It preserves the state uh, in a lot of cases, most cases, um, and it's, it's great. Uh, whereas on the web, we just, it took a little bit longer because it had to actually reload the page. Um, but yeah, so we, we, can, we can just keep going like this, I guess. Yeah, uh, I'm ready. And, <laughs> all right. Uh, so. We could start off by um, maybe just getting the corgis out of the database and just displaying the, the 
URLs, let's say, or, or some some data about it, just so we see like a a bunch of junk on the screen. Okay. And that would be exactly use corgis from DB, and then does that return an array or just the corgis? No, it just returns the corgis. Okay. No arguments. No arguments. Okay. Um, and then if I want to do, like, can I just drop them in like this and it'll be a, a dumped object? Um, you'll have to use json.stringify okay. to do that. Um, otherwise, it'll, I believe, I'll throw an error. No! Can't resolve Firebase. Oh, I didn't install uh, yes, all the dependencies. That's my bad. Uh, there should just be one dependency here. So if you go back to the terminal again, you can open a new. Well, Oops. let's just control C out of that uh, and restart it once we're done. Uh, dun, dun, dun. And then I can. So let's, just... let's run expo install Firebase, actually, instead of yarn. So oh, okay. the reason for doing this is that expo install is just a wrapper around yarn or NPM, depending on what you use on your machine. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's able to determine what version of some known set of packages is compatible with your project. Um, because oh. across the ecosystem, there's always, as we know, again, JavaScript changing versions of things. And whether that's compatible with your version of X, Y, or Z, like you need to uh, potentially install some certain version of it. And so the one that we're installing here is one that is not the latest. It's close to the latest, but it's the one that we have tested and verified is compatible with this version of Expo. And so we'll bump that again in the future. Nice. Okay. And so in in doing the the install and reloading, um, it's you yeah. know the format is not great because we didn't style it at all. <laughs> but I can see yeah. that we are getting back our images. Here's the, the unsplash right. URL. Yeah. Uh, so if you hit refresh in the simulator as well, uh, when you shut down the server and uh, restart it, it's unfortunately necessary to do that. Okay, here it comes. Slow. Come on, we'll get there. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay, that's good. So, we're we're in business yeah. here. Um, yeah. So if I want to show these images, yeah. Uh, is there like a special so, image tag or? Exactly. So uh, from React Native, we're going to add an import for the image component. Like this. Exactly. Okay. And now, yeah. So there, there may be a couple things to think about here. Um, we could just display the images um, and kind of, in a, well, maybe let's do that first. Let's display them in a, in a column okay. first. Uh, and then we'll, we'll switch it over to like a row layout so it looks more like the Photos app or that kind of thing. But it's worth pointing out here that the default for Flexbox in React Native is to use flex direction column, which is different from um, on the web. And that was an intentional mm -hmm. choice uh, because usually on mobile layouts, you want things to flow vertically rather than horizontally, um, mm -hmm. as people tend to use their phones in portrait mode. So it was kind of a, uh, a pragmatic choice. I'm not sure if people would make this choice again in the future. I don't think anyone's particularly upset about it, but it's just something that is a little divergent um, sure. Interesting difference. Uh, so do I like? I'm I'm kind of making some some educated guesses here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, am I the, am I in the right right direction here? And then do I still use like source yeah. alt? Uh, so we use source with s o u r c e. So the full okay. thing spelled out, and then we have to provide an object. Uh, so okay. Source with an an object. So there will be like two curly braces on either side. And then we use the URI key, so URI. Uh, and then we pass in the URL here, so corgi.url. Corgi um, yeah. uh, and for providing the alt tag, uh, we want to use the, uh, the accessibility label. Uh, yeah, so we have to say accessible equals true on it. Uh, oh, sorry, this isn't in this source, it's outside. That's just a prop. Like this? Yeah. And then add the accessibility label. X 
accessibility label, and that would be corgi dot. What do we call it? Or I wait, think we have a description on it. I think we just put corgi in the other. Oh, uh, okay. All right. Yep. Which. Well, that's that's on me. Um, <laughs> each child uh, should have oh. a unique key prop. Okay, so I can do that. Yeah. Key equals corgi dot id. What are you unhappy about? What did I do wrong? Not read property God, map. Son of a null. biscuit. Oh, oh. Um, it would be corgis like this, or. Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, and then I'm going to dump this part. Yep, we yeah, can get rid of that. Um, and then <laughs> Let's move this up. we're going to see something interesting here, which is uh, that we're not going to see anything at all. Uh -huh. um, and so the reason this is, is another divergence from the default on the web. Um, if an image is a remote image, and we don't know the dimensions of it up front, then it's assumed to be 0, 0. And the reason for that is that in mobile apps, typically, you don't see the kind of experience of an image appearing and then shifting the layout of the entire app. Uh, sure, OK, is, yeah. It's certainly not ideal on web, but it's something that people have kind of become accustomed to, and so it's not as much of a faux pas. So in, in this case, we have to actually explicitly give it a, uh, a width and a height. And does that go um, in so, the source? Uh, we can just add it on the uh, root props for the object or for the component. So you know, under the style, uh, so under the style key, uh, style, yeah. And, and then just like object a object there. Yeah. Wait. What did we set these? Did, were these square? Well, yes, I believe it was square. And then there was like a resize mode set on it. Um, and does it take do straight thing. pixels like this, or do I need to give it units? Yeah, so actually, in this case, they you can treat them like pixels, but they're uh, they're actually points uh, on the ah, device. Okay. And so it it will automatically factor in the pixel density. Oh, interesting. That's cool. Yeah. So um, okay, there we go. Who's who's putting not corgis in this corgi app? <laughs> You're all. I'm guilty of that. <laughs> there we go. look at this. Look at that. That is a good corgi. Um, okay, yeah. now this is great. Here we go. So <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that was me. Uh, so oh, you did this. You did this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you saw the uh, the intro photo that we had on, on the beginning of, of uh, the stream, you'll see my dog that looks remarkably similar to some of these dogs on here. There we go. I like that one. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, they're, they're, they're very good dogs. I, I, I will say. <laughs> um, so we might want to also just uh, specify a resize mode here. Um, OK. So we've given it 200 by 200. But maybe we want every uh, everything to just fit within it. Or rather, we want everything to definitely take up 200 by 200. Mm -hmm. space that, that we provided. So we can set the resize mode uh, to cover. Um, like that? Yep. Or not like that. There. OK. And that'll take care of it for us. So if we have some image that ends up being really uh, like much taller than it is wide or wider than it is tall, then we'll be protected from that looking silly in the UI. Uh, gotcha. But you can also change it to like contain um, and couple others. So, sure. I believe it's similar to what's supported on the web. Cool. OK. So we have some uh, some corgis. That's a pretty good, pretty good start. Um, so <laughs> they don't belong at the Corgi Expo, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they are honored guests at the Corgi Expo. Uh, Aha! So Behold, my bucket. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, so if we go, go over to the iOS app, we'll notice that we can't actually scroll in the app. Yes, I did notice uh, that. I, I'm attempting to scroll up and down right now, and it's not working. I'm yeah. pulling up and down. Right. So this is another component that's needed here is we need to actually add a scroll view. 
Um, okay. The default on the web is for the, the root com component, a root element, to be scrollable on the vertical axis. Uh, so you just get that by default. Um, but we actually need to explicitly add a, a scroll view uh, here. So what we can do is um, first let's look at the style for the, the wrapper view. You see view style styles.container. Scroll down to the bottom. We have uh, a few things that uh, we probably don't want to keep, like align items center and justify content center. We can we can just delete those two. Okay. Um, and then we're going to import the scroll view component. From React Native? Yeah. And that's, uh, what is this pass? No. What is it? Exactly. Uh, yeah, what, I can't remember what, what is it when you capitalize the first one? I don't remember. I don't case. <laughs> Someone will tell us. Something. Yeah, we'll we'll find out shortly. Um, <laughs> Pascal is that Pascal case? Okay, so what what's? I think it might and, oh, and then this is snake case, and then you yeah. get screaming snake case, which is my favorite. <laughs> uh, which apparently this is like actually the name for it, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> I think kebab case has to be my my favorite. Kebab case is. Sounds delicious it does it really does sound delicious um okay so i've got i have the scroll view and then do i just put it around the view so let's let's put this inside of the view um okay so it's a child of that and it'll wrap everything else that is got it and including the status bar uh that doesn't actually matter where that goes uh, okay we, we could do it but yeah um Okay, there we go. So that's now we got scrollable now. And look at that. It's got it's already got like the bounciness of a, of a like a iOS app, which is Exactly. Oops, so this oh, <laughs> This is just using the uh, native UI scroll view component. So um, no emulation or anything happening there. It's just exactly as is nice. uh, in any other iOS app. Uh, cool. So maybe we can um, Answer this quick question from chat. Where is the status bar going there? Uh, the status bar just impacts the uh, the text that you see at the top of the iOS app, where there's like the Wi-Fi indicator and uh, network and so on. And so the component itself doesn't actually render any UI in place, but instead it changes the global uh, status bar UI. Um, and so there's another way you can do that by just making imperative calls to that. But uh, some people prefer, uh, including myself, to uh, use a component to do it. And then as you have different screens, uh, if that component is the uh, deepest active uh, component, then it will take precedence and style the status bar appropriately. Oh, cool. Um... How does Expo handle the notch? <laughs> yeah, the cutout things, yeah. Uh, so there's this library called uh, React Native Safe Area Context. Um, and maybe we'll, we'll skip over including that here just because we're sure. already on iPhone SE and we don't need to switch over and, and do all that. Uh, but uh, I can share, and we can share in the, the uh, show notes, uh, the example that I what was it called put safe? together. Safe area context. There you go. Yeah, um, and this allows you to programmatically read the um, the safe area insets. So there's some notch on the top of the screen and uh, home indicator on the bottom, uh, and you cool. can automatically inset that uh, using a safe area view component that it provides, uh, or you can read it programmatically and, and add it to your padding or do whatever you need to do with that. Nice. Cool. OK. So let's lay this out so that it's in a grid. OK. And, uh, and then we can probably just move on from there to, uh, well, we'll, we'll decide when we get there. But uh, so to lay this out in a grid, let's go back up to the scroll view component. And we'll just style this in line. Um, you can define styles on style sheet create uh, if you like to. Uh, when we're just messing around with things like this, it doesn't hurt to just include the style in line in the 
in the sure. component itself and you can figure that out there. So, uh, so there are actually two style props on scroll views. Uh, there's style, which refers to the container of the scrollable area. Okay. And then there's the content container style. So we're going to add this to content container style. Um, like that? And yeah. Okay. Uh, and I believe that's what's called. And then we're going to say flex direction row. And Okay. Yeah. Uh, and probably let's uh, maybe maybe actually a better way to do this because we have the behold my corgis text there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we might want to instead wrap the uh, the images in a view that uh, uses flex direction row. So we can get rid of the content container style and instead move that to the style. Yeah. Just get rid of that altogether, and yeah. prettier has failed me. Oh, because I didn't uh, finish wrapping. Yeah, yeah. There we go. All right. So now we have the text. We've got yeah. this good. Um, and then if we wanted to make these, back, this is fine. I think this is good enough. Uh, because so, we're, we're gonna have to make these wrap, yeah. right? Exactly. So we'll want to now add flex wrap. Flex wrap. wrap. That's right. Uh, yeah. Who really remembers these properties, anyways? Uh, okay, and Good. because the width is already um, more than half the width of the screen on the iOS simulator, uh, it'll just wrap all of them right away. So um, we can get the dimensions of the screen and maybe divide it by by three. Um, yeah, that's, that'll show you. Oh, you're getting the dimensions of the screen. How how are you doing that? So, so we can scroll up to the top uh, and import the dimensions API from React Native. Uh, is that just like how do you, what's dimensions. the yeah. dimensions? Uh, capital D. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's a bit of an awkward API, but uh, we'll use it here uh, for simplicity. Um, and now. To get the width, we do dimensions.get and then pass in the string window. The string window, OK. Yeah. And then get the uh, width property off of that. And then we'll just divide that by three, I guess. So okay. it can fit in three rows. And, and then we we'll want this to be square. Well. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, Ooh, beauty. Um, nice. OK. So it, it might actually be worth here. Uh, if you notice in the iOS simulator, um, we have the text underneath the status bar. Yes. Um, so it might actually be worth us going ahead and installing the safe area context library and just wrapping, for simplicity's sake, the, the scroll view entirely in a safe area view. Sure. So um, we can run see. expo so install. That. Can... Yeah. I need to expo stop these, install. don't I? Yeah, expo install. OK, so I'm going to start. Good, and then I'm going to open up the iOS and the web. You might have to hit reload still in the iOS. Command R. Do it. Yeah, I thought I was doing that. Maybe it, it's so fast that it's not actually showing me anything. Let's uh, let's load it and then we'll see if it's working. <laughs> sure. Um, so um, then I import. So we're going to import two things from here. Okay. We're going to import safe area view and safe area provider. React. And then... Okay. Um, and then. Let's make a another component that we export as the root. And we'll call it maybe just like app container or something like that. So export default uh, function. And we, we can get rid of the current default export. We can just call it function app. OK. Oh, so you want to like use the app down here? Yeah. Or even like you can use it before it also. It doesn't really matter since it's closely. 
that's what see, default so function. Function. Container. Okay. And then we're just going to return the app wrapped in safe area provider, exactly. Like that. Yep. Okay. So we need to re return that. I guess oh, I got to actually return it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Like the Stone Age. Okay. And then. Um, cool. So now we can change the view that wraps the entire thing to just safe area view. Looks like the iOS app isn't reloading. Yeah, I feel mm. like something went weird with okay. it. Okay, try double clicking or try pressing Command and D. Uh, command and D. Yeah, Command D. Is that okay? And try pressing reload there. It seems like maybe something is going on where uh, I can see like one of the cursors. Uh, try pressing Shift and there. Okay, I think that might have fixed it. Yeah, that seems to have that seems to have done okay. what we needed, right? Great. Yeah, so it, it just uh, added a little inset so that it's not under the status bar. And so this, and it this didn't would add for, it here, which is nice. Yeah, exactly. There's no need for that there. Um, but of course, yeah, we do need it. Cool. Uh, and, and this would account for the insets on the, the, uh, from the notch or from the home indicator uh, in the case of uh, the iOS 10 and higher devices. Nice. Uh, cool. Very and cool. And on Android as well. Yeah. Great. So I think we can go back now. Um, and we kind of have two choices for where to take this. We can um, follow through and get parity with the previous example um, by adding sign in, uh, the anonymous sign in, um, and potentially sign up button as well if we care about that. Uh, and then add the text input where we can drop in a link to an unsplash uh, Corgi image. Or we can build a kind of like modal. So when you press on one of uh, the uh, Corgi images, we see like a larger version of, of the image. So, um, I mean, I, so I feel like, uh, is there anything inherently different? Well, hmm, chat, what do you think? Do you want to see a modal or do you want to see form inputs? <laughs> I'm going to give you like, Five seconds to decide, and then I'm going to decide for you. <laughs> Democracy at its finest. You have modal. We've got two votes for modal. We're doing modals. <laughs> Make something happen when you boop corgis. Perfect. Yeah, let's do modals. <laughs> okay. So when you boop a corgi, you get a modal. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, okay, so let's. Uh, wow. Overwhelmingly modal. Nobody cares about Nobody that. Nobody <laughs> wants to write forms. <laughs> <laughs> uh, too real. Uh, all right. So let's uh, import a couple components okay. from React Native. Uh, let's import a component called touchable opacity. So here we go. Uh, and then another one called modal. OK. So. One thing that we need to consider here is that the modal component is actually not implemented on web currently. Uh, we can use a workaround for this, um, uh, but we'll just have to factor that in. Um, and in fact, so that we can actually properly do a, a nice workaround, let's also import the platform uh, API from React Native. OK. Cool. So we have three things we need. Um, let's start by making the Corgis boopable. So uh, we're going to wrap each of the images in a touchable opacity. Yeah. And we'll have to hoist the key prop up to that as well. Right, right. Good mornings. Uh, and then we can add on press as a prop to that. Uh, and on press. It's not called on click because you're not really clicking. Uh, and I guess press is a more generic word that can apply to click or a actual tap or a variety of things like that. Um, so on press just takes a callback that okay. does something. Uh, so for now, let, let's just uh, write alert. So we can use the same window.alert kind of thing, but just call it alert. And 
Maybe I could just say boop, I guess, for now. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we should be able to see that as we tap on one of these corgis. There we go. Boop, and same thing should happen on the web. Beautiful. Boop. Perfect. Um, all right, so now we can put this modal component to use. Uh, yeah, so let's do it. So probably what we want to do here is have uh, something like a selected corgi or booped corgi state. And when you boop the corgi, we set it as the booped corgi. And okay. when there's a booped corgi, then we display the modal. So, and um, do I do that with like just regular old hooks, like use state and everything? Exactly. Okay, yeah. perfect. So, yeah. So let's use state uh, and we will say, um, we've got booped corgi, set booped corgi, this is use state, and we'll just leave it undefined for now. Um, and then down here, when we do the boop, we want to say set booped corgi to set the corgi. Exactly. Okay. Uh, cool. So now we can um, render this modal component. Um, doesn't matter too much where we put it. Let's put it outside of the scroll view uh, as a uh, sibling of the status bar. Um, and modal and takes a uh, few properties um, that we care about here. Is, am I, I'm doing it like this, right? Like I want to not show it exactly. if there's no booped corgi? Um, well, we, we can still have the modal component rendered if there's no booped corgi. Oh, OK. Um, it doesn't matter too much. Let, let's keep it rendered, yeah, um, in okay. case we want to do an animation with it. Cool. Works for me. Oh, stampede. So, good, ooh. good, good. Here we go. <laughs> Party. <laughs> All right. Um, nice. So, um, okay. so there are a few props we care about. Um, let's set transparent to true on the modal. And we'll set visible to uh, the, I guess it coerced the Boolean out of the booped corgi. Uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, that will work for now. Um, and now let's uh, add a view here. And we're just going to create like a container to put the corgi image in. and. Uh, let's set the. Uh, Do I just kind of want the same thing here? Yeah, actually, that would work fine if we just copy that in as a child. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pull this across, and then instead of divided by three, we can just make it the full window width. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And realistically, like in a, we we would want to do some logic here about like whether the device width is greater than the height or the and use the height if so, or otherwise use the width. But let, let's not worry too much about like handling. Uh, we'll, we'll just assume everything is in a situation where the uh, the height is greater than the width, and, and just use the width as the factor here. Yeah, that's good. OK. Uh, and we also need to, yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, um, I'm just making sure that we don't try to render if we don't have one set. Yeah. So now what we'll want to do with the view is we'll want to make sure we center uh, the boot corgi. So uh, we'll set some style on the view. And we can add back, um, just do like flex one to take up the full screen. So th this modal component actually just renders at a different layer above everything else in the app. It actually uses the uh, underlying native API for that. Um, so we can just trust that this is independent of the view hierarchy from, okay. from the rest. So it's going to take up full screen. Um, and maybe we want to set like a background color on it. Maybe we can use RGBA for this and give it a little bit of transparency. So background color, maybe 000, 0, 0 0.5 or something like that. Cool. Sure. Uh, yeah. OK. So let's see what we did wrong. Let's nice. see what we did something. wrong. You, you knew <laughs> uh, that. So, oh, wait, that one works. Uh, yeah, so the modal component, yeah, doesn't quite work on, on web yet. We'll, we'll add our workaround for that. 
Okay, okay. Cool. So we didn't do anything wrong on, on native, except for the fact that we cannot dismiss a boot corgi once it's been booted. Yeah. Which, uh, there we go. A little bit smaller, make it look. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Beautiful. Just that little design touch. <laughs> okay. So now um, we need a dismissal. Yeah. So we can, the easiest way to do this right now is, uh, just without digging into other concepts is let's add a touchable opacity as a wrapper to this image again. And um, touch up. Oh, uh, to the yeah, got it. Touchable yeah. opacity, and then I'm gonna drop the other side down here. And we need to on press uh, just set booped corgi to null. There we go. Beautiful. Look at it go. Oh, that that <laughs> it's amazing. Like there's just like a tiny bit of of niceness that comes with that that just feels polished that I really like. Um, <laughs> you know, because it's like these are the sorts of things that like oh that 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 little bit of transition that happened there that all yeah. would have required just a lot of CSS. So it's nice that that just works. Yeah. Okay. So if we want to um, make this work on the web. What uh, what ha what needs to happen next? Uh, touchable opacity so, is the is what makes it clickable. It's um, where what why is it called touchable opacity? Is that just because it fades in and out? Exactly. So it it changes the opacity as you press on it. There's also a touchable highlight, which will change the background color, um, mm. and it's touchable without feedback, which has no visible uh, uh, output on the view, um, and I believe people have built things like touchable bounce, which will make it scale a little bit. Oh, nice. You press yeah. on things and um, yeah, and you can just make your own effects as well with it. Um, but it's a little out of scope for what we can cover today. Oh, for sure, yeah. 20, 28 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we so some animations. We can add animation type uh, as a prop to uh, to the modal component first. Um, Modal. And then we'll get this working on the web. Here we go. So okay. we can say animation type equals fade. Fade. So a little. Really, subtle it's subtle. In. It uh, might not even be coming through on the stream, but it looks really nice. <laughs> uh, we could also change it to slide, uh, which might look a little funny because we have a, uh, a background that takes up the full screen. Whoop. Um, <laughs> right. So probably in this case, you would want to do something um, that doesn't involve a full screen background. So fade, fade is going to look better. Um, yeah. Uh, someone also asked about the kind of like native animation where it would have uh, something called like a shared element transition, where it would go from when you press on the uh, image to like transition the image to uh, to the new view. Uh, yeah. Um, and. This isn't something that's built in React Native out of the box, but uh, there's a library called React Native Shared Element, which does a really fantastic job of this. And so, um, yeah, feel free to check that out. Uh, my coworker Hein built this, uh, and it's, it's really awesome. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll throw that in the show notes as well if you want to give that a shot. Um, nice. Okay, so cool. So let's we, make it work on web. Absolutely. I, this is I'm I'm not gonna lie I'm kind of blown away at how quickly we got this done. Uh, okay, so <laughs> let's let's do it. Let's make it work on the web. Okay, so uh, to make this work on web, we're going to take advantage of the fact that uh, position fixed will uh, make the element relative to the root element rather mm -hmm. than uh, relative to the parent. So on this style prop on the um, view wrapper that we have, uh, so right there, yep. Uh, let's do dot, dot, dot. So we're gonna spread, yeah, we're, we're gonna use that uh, in a moment. So okay. dot, 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 uh, and then platform dot select. Oh wait, no, platform select. Yep, and then it's a function, it, it takes an object, and then we're gonna use the web key on the object. And then that will also be an object itself, which is a set of styles that will apply only when this is running on the web. 
Oh, um, I get it. So we're this. There was a question earlier about this, and I, I didn't want to derail us, but I'm glad we got here. Yeah. So if I want to apply styles to only one platform, like if we're doing something silly on the web where we want to whatever, like we want to play with some web, uh, some CSS specific stuff on the browser, we would put it here. Yeah, um, Got this it. is one good way to do it. Um, and of course, you can play around with however you want to actually uh, make that work for you, but uh, you can you know, pull it out to a variable or do whatever you want to do there. Um, but then there's also, as I mentioned earlier, the .web.js extension. There's also .ios.js, .android.js, mm -hmm. .native.js. And so you can kind of, um, if you had like a styles uh, file that was like styles.web.js, and then maybe you pull this in for like the import styles and like the modal for web will have these styles built in. Um, OK, so we have fixed. Uh, now we need to set top zero, left zero, bottom zero, right zero. <laughs> so just basically take up the whole thing, please. Um, OK. OK. Oh. Uh, all right. So uh -oh. now image, I, just... I think if you scroll. You know, oh, wait. Our, I think our, our modal is just not, it's like not clickable. Um, right. So the image isn't. Uh, visible currently. Um, so let's, uh, oh, what's going on? Oh, right, because, <laughs> right, because we're rendering the view regardless of whether we have boot to Corgi or not. Uh, so we might need to move this into That's the boot to Corgi. Totally <laughs> fine. Let's do that. Just move this down. Boop. There we okay. go. So, Looks silly because we haven't. Uh, it, maybe this would be a, a good time to change the uh, styles on that. But um, basically, because the width is is greater than the height, we're going to end up with a silly looking corgi. Um, all right. Yeah, we can just. Yeah. There we go. Good work around. When in doubt, hit it with a hammer. Oh no. Um, let's see. <laughs> Boom. There we go. So Thanks. now we have a uh, a like web app working that'll let us show these photos. Mm -hmm. We have a an iOS app running. Mm -hmm. And theoretically, uh, I don't know that I'm going to try to also fire up an Android emulator at the same time that we're running Xcode and all my streaming stuff. But uh, <laughs> we also have a, an Android app running back here that we could get to if we wanted to. Um, so yeah, we could, I mean, maybe someone on the stream could verify it. Uh, if you press D to open up the dev tools again, uh, the, the browser-based dev tools, um, we can click on connection, change to tunnel. Tunnel. Um, and then if someone has the Expo Client app on their Android phone, they could scan that QR code. And so take a screenshot of it if you plan on doing this so we can switch away. Um, and scan that QR code uh, in the Expo Client app for Android. And it'll take a minute to load. It's loading over this tunnel connection. And, um, but eventually, it'll load, and you'll see that it will work fine. It looks like somebody's oh, it looks doing like it. Something's happening in the background. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Uh, looks like Ruben is doing it. Awesome. Thanks, uh, looks like he might have opened a debugger as well. <laughs> which is going to be insanely slow because he's uh, debugging <laughs> over, through the JavaScript running on your computer in Chrome over a tunnel in every frame. It's going to be <laughs> fine. Don't worry about it. This is, you know, it's just like working on a VPN. <laughs> yeah, might want to disable that debugger. But yeah. <laughs> no, this is great. I mean, like, how cool is that? That that just happened. That we're, you know, we're here. We are. Like, uh, how do I go back? Do I just Delete this. Oh, uh, yeah, you can just close that. Uh, Back here. Sorry, whoever's debugging. Oh, no, <laughs> what did I just do? Uh, it's OK, you can close that. Wait, how did I, wait, where did my debugger app thing go? Well, oh, whatever. Well, um, I can just open this again. OK, cool. So people confirmed that worked. Um, That's super great. cool. So let's, uh, let's just deploy the web app to Netlify really quick. So we can just see like what that, what that looks like. So yeah, okay. Right. So hold on. We're we're just gonna go ahead and get this thing live on the internet, is what you're saying? Okay. 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh it's like a, I love it. I'm so into this. Okay, so I'm going to stop this now. All of your Android apps are about to break. Um, all right, we're done. So, <laughs> cool. Okay, so, so what do I do next? So we need to run the build command to produce a uh, distribution build for web. Mm -hmm. So to do that, we run expo build colon web. Any, I just push the button. Any uh, parameters or anything? No, we don't need to pass anything for this. Uh, there's some good defaults provided. Um, I think it's probably going to be a pretty large bundle because Firebase is massive and yeah. importing the entire thing, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> It's okay. We're learning. <laughs> yeah. uh, Using Node to generate images. Yep. Uh, yeah. Um, because what it's doing is it, it's generating um, various icons, um, like PWA icon, things like that, uh, and generating different sizes for them from a single image asset. Yeah. Uh, so now we have uh, the web build directory, which we can just deploy straight to Netlify. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to Netlify init. And oh, I need to do uh, GitHub. Cool. Yeah, we can do that. So let's get. Uh, well, we could we could actually just go into the uh, web build directory and just run Net Netlify deploy. It's like the easiest way to do this. Oh yeah, I guess we could do um, that. Yeah, let's do that. Um, so we'll do Netlify deploy. Uh, yeah. Let's get it out there. Sure. Create and configure a new site. Put it on my team. Uh, we're gonna call this. Uh, Corgi Photos Expo. Sure. Publish directory is this one. And it's done. Beautiful. There you go. So that, I mean, uh, like, I love, this is a cool workflow. Like we just built a native app, a web app. Uh, so iOS, Android, web all at once. And we've already got the web app online. Uh, so there'd, there'd be a little bit more to it to get the native apps up because um, there's like app store yeah. reviews and, and that sort of thing. Totally. So um, in terms of actually getting the build itself, uh, it would be a very similar process to what we just did where rather than running Expo Build Web, you run Expo Build iOS or Expo Build Android. And then we guide you through the process of creating all of the credentials that you need, like the key store. Um, and for provisioning profile and, and, and so on. Um, and then we give you this result, which you can then take and upload to the App Store and Play Store. Mm -hmm. um, but that process of, of taking it and putting it onto the store, the first time you do it is a bit uh, arduous. As yeah. as, like You have to provide screenshots on a variety of different device sizes. You have to provide a bunch of metadata and so on. So. Um, yeah, we, we could uh, maybe just do a, a simple um, mock version of this by running like expo build colon iOS dash T simulator and or even just leave out the dash T and we'll be prompted. Yeah. yeah that like that? Prompted. Yeah. And so this will do a, a Oops. binary build. Oh, we've got a, an issue there. Not low. Oh, I'm in the wrong directory is why. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, OK. so. This will take, uh, uh, you can just use this suggested one, just put this okay. it doesn't really matter. Um, and due to some uh, interesting stuff, security related on the uh, newest version of macOS, there's a little command we'll need to run to be able to actually uh, open this app in the simulator. Okay. But this is often a good way to uh, say like, okay, I want to test this now outside of the Expo client app, right? I want to test it in an environment that's closer to the production environment. So then you can do a simulator build of it um, if you're not already on test flight or something. It just makes it a little bit easier to mm -hmm. get something running on your machine um, and, it's, and it's closer yeah. to its final form. <laughs> so while we're waiting so for this to build, there's a couple questions in the chat that uh, that I'm, I'm also curious about. So if, if we were going to put in like media queries for the, the web app to make this a, a fully kind of web app desktop experience, would we just use that platforms.web or like the .web.js or how, how would you approach that? Uh, there's, there are a couple libraries for media queries. Um, and so Evan Bacon, who I believe is actually in the chat currently, um, 
made one called Expo slash Match Media. Uh, and he wrote, yeah, it's actually the first post there. Is that? Yeah, the first post that you see in the results is something that Evan wrote about uh, how to do media queries that will work on all platforms. Okay. Um, and so this is a pretty good tutorial for that. Uh, it uses a hook called Use Media Query from uh, React Responsive. And uh, basically, the Expo Match Media Library polyfills the APIs that are needed for that to work. Nice. Um, yeah, so that, that's what I would, I would do. OK, and then uh, another question was about, uh, is there anything planned to automate uh, generating like required app store screenshots or any of the things that you would need to, to submit the app for the first time? Um, we definitely are interested in helping more in the submission process. And we kind of think of the issues in the submission process as being grouped in different categories. Like there's the sure. first time submission, which is by far the most difficult. And so there are a variety of things that we're considering for how we can help with that. Um, but then the nth submission is actually extremely easy in, in comparison. Um, and it, so and we've so far, sorry. Well, so when, when you do that, so after you do the first one, it sounds like the first one you've got to, there's like, you know, paperwork you got to fill out. You got to, it sounds like yeah. generate a bunch of screenshots. Um, yeah. The second one, is the second one as easy as like, I have generated a new bundle here? Or like what, what's involved in that? Yeah, basically. Um, so, I mean, there are multiple ways to think of updating your app once it's on the store, right? There's the over the air updates mm. uh, approach, which is here's something that I can do to make a change to the app that doesn't require building a new binary. So if you're not doing something like changing the app icon or updating to a new version of the Expo SDK that has different native code or changing the app name or all these things that are kind of like uh, included statically at build time. Um, if you're not doing those, if you're just updating some JavaScript, making some changes there, then um, then you'll be totally fine just uh, doing an over the air update, which would mean running Expo Publish mm -hmm. and possibly specifying a channel to publish to, uh, and then that that's it. And then you just let it like, go to your users. Uh, the other, uh, in terms of like when you actually need to do a new binary and distribute that, then uh, for the nth submission. You do the build and then run expo upload colon iOS or colon Android, and then we just take care of uploading it to the store for you. Oh, um, nice! And then you can go into the the uh, developer console or uh, App Store Connect and uh, decide whether you're going to start distributing it through test flight or uh, make it a beta or whatever you need to do at that point. But uh, yeah, it's very it's, it's close enough to running you know Netlify. Deploy, although unfortunately still slowed down by the the process required of going to the website afterwards and manually um, uh, shepherding it along sure. through the release process. Um, yeah, so, uh, but do we want to add automatic screenshots? I think that would be really cool. Um, it's not something that we're working on for the next six months, but uh, perhaps at some point uh, not too far after that. It looks or like there was a recommendation for Fastlane. I don't know what that is. Yeah, Fastlane is great for that. Fastlane, actually, a lot of the tools that we built are also, are also built on top of Fastlane. It's this really great uh, Ruby uh, library, actually, that uh, uh, does a lot of these things for you, like helping you do builds with uh, different uh, for different environments and helping you, helping you do things like you know, run tests, uh, capture screenshots, manage credentials, cool. um, submit to the App Store, and so on. Um, yeah, so there, there's some some cool stuff with that, I and mean, it's a matter of like uh, building user experience around this and making it um, feel really good and, and really easy to to do. So yeah, we'll we'll, we'll hopefully get there at some point. Nice. Um, is it, it, it's still building. It is it hung or is it does it just take a while? <laughs> uh, so it's queued right now. So um, part of the way that we actually uh, make money as a business is that we. This build service is free, but during peak times, rather than us uh, paying for more uh, machines at Mac Stadium to handle the, the peak load without any weight, uh, we currently uh, added a queue. So if you are a free user, you might have to wait uh, at, at the peak time, maybe like 20 minutes for, for a build uh, to go through. Um, so yeah, it's something where uh, uh, it's just kind of 
part of, of how it works. Uh, you sure. you could also set up uh, Turtle CI uh, is the, the the tool that that runs the builds. You could set that up on your own CI server if you like, and it'll run the builds for you. Uh, okay. Yeah, it looks like we might be queued here. If you actually just click back to your terminal, um, you could command click through to the turtle status link. So xbio.io slash turtle dash status at the top of the screen. Uh, just about that. Yep. Uh, and this will show us uh, approximately like this is a pretty direct view into what's going on. So we can see oh, that there cool. are 137 builds for Android in the last hour. And, and we can see it's for, and like it's yes. ramping up too, like it's getting busier. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, cool. we're right around the peak time. So maybe I shouldn't have suggested doing a build right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it looks like there's about a, a six minute wait currently for iOS builds. So I, this might work at some point. We can kind of leave it in the background and see. Yeah, we'll, we'll let that keep running. Um, while we're doing that, it, so chat, you've got about five-ish minutes left to start asking questions if, you, if you've if you got any. Um, so drop those now. Uh, Brent, for someone who is you know watching this and wants to go a little bit deeper, are there any yeah. any resources that you would recommend somebody starts with if they, if they want to take this further? Yeah, I think that there are a couple of good official resources. So there's reactnative.dev uh, is the official documentation for React Native. They've put a lot of work into improving the onboarding experience in the docs. Um, there's some, so if you just click through to the docs there on the top left, there's uh, some really good introductions that kind of go through things at a, I think, an easily digestible pace. Um, it, has notes that apply to people coming from a web background or an iOS background or Android background, kind of to make sure that everyone is able to uh, keep up. Uh, and actually, what you're seeing there embedded in the page, if you scroll up a little bit, is this thing called Snack. Uh, so this is uh, this website we provide. It's kind of like Code Sandbox for uh, React Native apps. Yeah. And um, so it allows you to uh, see, make some changes to the code and then see it live uh, on, on the page. So there's a lot of interactive examples built into the documentation. I think maybe yeah. it didn't adjust as you resize the window, so you can't see the preview. Maybe toggle see. the preview off and on. Maybe that'll show up. Not really sure it's going to be there. Uh, actually, I think this website isn't intended to be viewed at this width. Maybe if you zoom out a little bit further, it might actually fix it. Oh, there it is. OK, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, so you can see right now the, the web version of it. Um, but if you click over to like my device, that'll give you a QR code you can scan uh, just to the left of, of iOS. Even oh, cool. So and so, and this is like the tunnel phone. thing? Yeah, exactly. Um, and and so this will just allow you to connect and make changes right in your browser. So it's kind of like nice interactive examples while learning about the core mm -hmm. components in React Native, the fundamentals, uh, the dreaded text input and forms. <laughs> and, uh, uh, list views, which we didn't cover here, um, which is uh, definitely a valuable topic to learn about. We just kind of rendered all of our image components as is, but you probably want to use a component that is better suited for rendering large lists of data once you uh, uh, get beyond a few a few. And, views. It, and the reason for that would be like, are these virtualized lists? Like it's it's going to pull things out of memory so you don't bog down your machine. Yeah. Um, so the optimizations that the list views in React Native uh, core use don't actually unmount uh, views as you scroll past them, uh -huh. uh, but it will at least lazily render the views that, that come into screen. I got so, you. Uh, it'll only render ahead a certain amount, and you can customize that. Yeah. It also provides some things like the sticky uh, headers if you use this thing called the section list. Um, so as you scroll, you know maybe a a header will stick to the top, top of the screen as you scroll past it, so you know what section you're in. And that kind of thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've got a couple um, questions in chat. Uh, how well, does Expo manage? One, oh, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. One, one other resource uh, is a tutorial I wrote in the Expo docs. So if you go to docs.expo.io, uh, there is the first thing that you land on is get started. And in the first steps under the tutorial link on the uh, sidebar, uh, so this just um, basically guides you through building an app not too dissimilar from what we're looking at here uh, today, but something where you can actually um, pick, uh, like use a couple of native APIs, like an image picker to use something from your camera or from your camera roll on your device, and then take that image and share it with somebody else using the sharing API. Cool, and OK. Through, um, 
splash screen and icon and, and kind of all the, these sort of basic things. So uh, that's another thing I'd recommend going through. Nice. Very cool. Uh, okay. So uh, questions from the chat. Bruno asks, how does Expo manage push notifications? Um, so we actually, I think, have a pretty awesome way of doing push notifications. We uh, we have a push service that um, abstracts over platform differences in push notifications. We currently don't uh -huh. support web push notifications, but for sure. iOS and Android, um, you basically, as a, as a consumer, you receive a Expo push token. And uh, yeah, we have a very long documentation page about it. <laughs> but you get a uh, uh, Expo push token, which as the developer, it doesn't matter to you if that's an iOS notification or, uh, token or an Android notification token. Uh, you just say, I want to send a notification to this Expo push token and use one of the um, server SDKs that Expo provides. I think we have like Node and Rust and Ruby and some variety of other things that a lot of people in the community have built. Nice. Um, and just basically send, say, send this notification with these contents to uh, this token. And you can send batch notifications to the API and so on. So it's uh, relatively well built in. Uh, I think if you scroll down on the push notifications overview page, uh, there's an example here. So this example uh, kind of is end to end showing you really more information than you even need to know. Mm -hmm. And this will allow you to like bypass even using the uh, uh, server SDK, like this is all the code that you need to send a notification to iOS and Android from even the app itself, which makes no sense. Like you would not send a push notification from the app. You would send it from your server. Right, but right, right, right. Just as like a, a complete example in one thing, and, and you can copy this into your app and try it out. And, and nice. And, uh, kind of cool. Um, okay, so a couple more questions here. Can you use Swift UI views as React Native components for, for iOS? Uh, not at the moment. Um, I think there's there's potentially a way to wrap that in UI kit views. Uh, I'm, I'm not too familiar with uh, how that is planning on working, but I, I have heard that uh, someone very smart is potentially going to be working on uh, a similar project. So it could be cool. something that we could see in the near future. Uh, let's see. John asks, is there a way to, to sync user interactions between screens when you're doing development? Like, so like if I click on the iOS app, if somebody's got the Android dev app open, it would, it would go to whatever view they're looking at. Uh, yeah, actually, um, Hashiram who works at Facebook, uh, used to work at Microsoft and he's on the Oculus team now. He actually built something like this back when he was working on app center at Microsoft. Um, I'm trying to find this uh, article. Uh, yeah, user interaction sync for React Native. Um, I don't know to what extent anything that he's done here is actively maintained. It's built in 2016. <laughs> sure, for sure. First, but uh, it's it's definitely doable and something that you could uh, explore if you were if you were so motivated. Okay. Um, let's see, libraries for animation. It looks like there's uh, reanimated. Yeah, reanimated. Uh, there's also just animated from React Native itself. Uh, there's this API called animated that's built into it that is uh, really nice. But the, the perk that you get from using reanimated is that it um, gives you, well, there, there are a few things, but the, the main motivation behind it originally was that it allows you to uh, perform animations entirely on uh, the main thread rather than having them be triggered from the JavaScript thread so that you could have a gesture where the gesture maybe changes state and then that fires an animation. So maybe you release the gesture and then you kind of turn it into like a throw animation. And so you wouldn't have to at any point call back into JavaScript and say, hey, I'm releasing the gesture. What should I do now? You can just perform all of that logic on the main thread. That's nice. kind of why reanimated came into existence. So if you don't need gesture interaction with your animations, then just using animated will probably be be fine for you in most cases. I got um, you. And yeah, it's just just looking into that first. And cool. Um, okay. Uh, so Vranchi has a couple questions that I think might be a little. Um, I I don't think that we would be able to talk about how anything was implemented without seeing the thing that was implemented. Um, 
<laughs> TypeScript for React Native, though, uh, it looks like when you expo init a project, there were multiple options for TypeScript starter. So if you want to yeah. start with TypeScript, sounds like you can just get up and running immediately with uh, with everything already configured. Yeah, totally. Um, so we we. I think ah, two man, years ago, I'm so sorry. I got to. We're out of time. Uh, so I got to. <laughs> if you have if you have more questions, go uh, tweet at Brent. So let's um, yeah. let's <laughs> let's wrap it up here. Brent, uh, go follow not Brent on Twitter. Uh, one more shout out to our sponsors, um, Netlify, Fauna, Sanity, and Auth Zero for making a, for making the the live captioning possible today. Thank you so much to White Co Captioning for doing the captioning. Um, chat as always. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today, Brent. Thank you for hanging out with us today. Um, I'm really excited. Like, make sure you go check out the scale, the schedule because we've got some really fun stuff coming up. Um, remember, you can uh, you can add the calendar to your your uh, Google Calendar and actually just get a notification of what's going on. Later this week, we have uh, who's coming on on Thursday? I think it's Ken Wheeler. It is, yeah. Ken Wheeler's going to come on, and we're going to do something weird on the uh, with the Web Audio APIs. He hasn't told me what it is. We're going to find out. I imagine it's going to be pretty fun, though, because, uh, you know, whenever Ken's involved, it's usually pretty experimental and odd. Uh, with that, thank you all so much for hanging out today. We're going to call this one done. Stay tuned, chat. We're going to raid. Brent, thank you again. We will see you next time.